Welcome to the 2023 Legislative Forum for the Environmental Law Section of the State Bar Association. Um, uh, Jim Regano, Chair of the Environmental Section, and so welcome. We have about 100 folks signed up today, about half of which are online. Um, so welcome, those of you that are uh, out there on your laptops. And we will be proceeding uh, right now, and the focus will be on energy and New York State's energy program and what we have proceeding. So um, we will turn, I'll turn the, um, the mic over to John Parker, who's the chair of today's program. So help me welcome John. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to the event today. There's um, not only folks here in Albany, um, the good news is, is that this is now an event that's become international. We have folks from China, the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic joining us. We have folks from all around the United States joining us, including uh, Wisconsin, Florida, Virginia, and, and DC. So this is an event that's become more important. Um, the issues we'll talk about today are critical, and you'll see as we go forward. Um, today's event is um, an interesting moment in the legislative cycle in New York State. Folks that are not familiar with it, we have a budget normally attempts to get finished by April 1st this year, unlike, not unlike many years in the past. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. So as a result of that, we've had to adjust and change our schedule, but we've been fortunate enough to have um, two leaders um, from the legislature join us, from both the Assembly uh, Environmental Conservation Committee and the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee. What I would like to do is I would like to just briefly introduce a, a, a member of our committee, uh, Senator Kaminsky, uh, former Senator Kaminsky of the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee. I'll say a brief word about him. He'll bring up uh, the Assemblywoman Glick, who is very tight time schedule, but we're very happy to have her here. Um, so Senator Kaminsky has been a leader in New York State environmental and energy law for many years prior to his leaving the, the Senate. He's currently a member of the Government Law and Policy Products in greenberg Prairie's Albany office. He, when chairing the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee, was one of the key authors of the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, something that really is going to drive the conversation today. He's been a federal prosecutor and an assistant district attorney. He's well versed in legislative, regulatory, and policy issues, including ESG matters. Um, he is a graduate magna cum laude from New York University Law School and his BA graduating summa cum laude from the University of Michigan. I'd like to welcome Senator Kaminsky as a member of our committee. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I have the distinct privilege and honor of introducing uh, uh, Chair Glick from the Assembly, who now chairs the Environmental Conservation Committee, having been one of the elected officials sitting in the back of the room saying, I've got eight minutes, I'm going to very uh, br uh, briefly introduce her and allow you to get the uh, benefit of her uh, comments and, uh, this morning. Um, there's a full bio that really reflects that Assembly Member Glick uh, has been a fighter for New Yorkers since 1990 in the Assembly. I got to serve with Assembly Member Glick. Uh, for a little over a year, and she is a force of nature. You know, when Assembly Member Engelbright left chairing his committee, um, people wondered what would happen to the state's environmental um, portfolio, what would happen with the agenda, would someone um, with season that understands the legislative process uh, be a, and a fighter for our environment be in that position? And the answer is a resounding yes, having Assembly Member Glick um, be in this position. Um, we're very fortunate to have her in that position and very fortunate to have her here this morning. Please welcome Assembly Member and Chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee, Deborah Glick. If I stand this way, I won't be seen. So I'm going to step over to this side. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, very happy to be here with you today, however briefly. We're not in charge of our schedule, despite what people may think. Um, and usually we find out on Friday, uh, the week at a glance uh, informs you how badly your schedule has been turned upside down. But this past week, uh, with the budget late, uh, we didn't even get that much guidance. So uh, it's been a day-to-day -day 
uh, when are we going into session? And um, that was at 10 today. So, um, and we're not known for being timely, so I felt I had a little bit of time to scoot over here and, and talk to you. Um, the situation is pretty dire. We see that from the UN's uh, reports. We know it from the storms that have been impacting various parts of the country and the world. Uh, we know that uh, every day a report of uh, yet another excessive melting of the Greenland ice is going to make the waters rise. What are we going to do about it here? What can New York do about it? And we do have these debates where some folks say New York State only contributes this small amount of emissions in comparison to the world. Why are we taking all of these dramatic steps that will uh, make uh, changes in our life when in fact we only affect so little? And the answer is everybody has to do their part. We can't force other people to do their part, but we cannot uh, abdicate our responsibility to the success of generations. And so we are embarking on making a lot of changes that are interrelated because the environment's interrelated. We have to dramatically increase uh, renewable energy, but you can't just build the power, you have to build transmission lines to get the power to people. Uh, so while I have the um, great honor of chairing the Environmental Conservation Committee, we're working very closely with the Energy Committee because everything overlaps. Uh, so I've said our goal should be to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing. And some of that will be ensuring that it's easier for people to choose an electric vehicle because we're actually going to have charging stations so that the anxiety about, am I going to run out of electricity? It's so easy to fill up the gas tank. Uh, we have to make them comfortable enough to make a, a good choice. Uh, and that is happening. Many people are shifting over in a dramatic way. And those are probably people who have uh, private homes where they can plug in. Uh, we need to do that for people who live in apartments like I do uh, and who uh, understands personally the concern about what am I going to do? How do I, where do I go? So we have to do that. We have to stop poisoning the earth. Uh, we see the impacts on birds, bees with uh, many of the chemicals that are used to make our food. Uh, we passed a Birds and Bees uh, Protection Act yesterday in the assembly. Uh, it's not an immediate ban on certain chemicals that are used that seem to be impacting uh, pollinators. Uh, and we did it by saying it's not going to go into effect till January of 2026. But the asking us to slow this down, which was the mantra from the other side of the aisle, um, we can't ignore what we see before us. So we have to stop uh, the overuse of plastics. You know, I'm looking around and not every, there's a few who might remember getting their milk delivered in a glass bottle that was in an insulated box outside. And when you were done, you put the empties there, they took them back, they sterilized them and sent them back to you with milk in it. We moved away from that because plastics was easy lighter, not breakable, etc. But now the oceans are full of plastic and not easy to get rid of it. So we're going to be working as aggressively as we can this session to pass an extended producer responsibility act to say you can't just make your materials and that's the end of it. You have to have some responsibility for helping us clean up the waste because right now 
that's falling on the taxpayers. And so consumers are going to see some changes. Industry is going to see some changes. And municipalities are going to also, likewise, try to figure out the best, easiest, uh, long-term solution for greater recycling. So those are some of the things that are on my plate. On the energy side, the building renewables is really the all-electric buildings. New buildings should be built with uh, using the up-to-date technology so they can heat and cool their buildings uh, with geothermal renewable energy. Uh, it's not new. It's been going on in lots of other places. Oswego, which is uh, part of the State University and having had the great honor of chairing the Higher Ed Committee for many, many years, I know that it has to be, you know, the, the pandemic makes it hard to remember was that three years or five years, you have to, if it was three years, you have to add two. <laughs> so it was about five years ago, maybe more, they built a new science building, totally geothermal, and they are in a very cold part of the state. So this notion that it's not a good technology, it doesn't work in cold weather, they're using it in the Scandinavian countries. I just want to point out that we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, and so in those new buildings, we should only be using geothermal. We have to make it easier for those companies to do that because there are some obstacles that we're gonna work on this year uh, to make it easier for them. They have to drill pretty far down. They should not be viewed as if they are extractive industry they aren't pulling anything out of the ground. They're simply putting a pipe, uh, a, a dual pipe, a, a, a loop pipe into the ground. But right now we treat them as if they're doing oil and gas drilling. Needless to say, that creates uh, regulatory issues and adds cost that is unnecessary. So those are some of the things that we hope, you know, wishing and hoping because until we get the budget, we're really not gonna focus heavily on our, in, our, our legislative um, agenda. And um, those of us who chair committees are, you know, um, you may not see total panic on my face, but it's in my heart uh, because everybody's gonna want their bills and some of them need work and we only have like five weeks. I wouldn't be unhappy to stay an extra week or two if it's, that's what it takes to get all of these very crucial things done, but I may be in the minority. Um, so those are the things that are on uh, the immediate agenda, but there are follow-ups to that, uh, to those things that um, we're going to have to work on. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and some of them fit together easily and some don't but that's, that's kind of where we are. And those are some of the bigger legislative pieces that I think we'll be able to get to. So I thank you. And uh, did you want me to take a question or two? Um, I, I, I'll be happy to take a couple of questions. Seeing no hand, yes, John. If anyone online has a question, they can type it into the chat. Assemblywoman, thank you very much for your time today. It's very much appreciated, and I, we all do appreciate your tight timeline. Um, one of the topics for today is looking at the energy industries that are trying to make the goals occur, make them in reality as we go forward in the next decade. I was wondering, just in your experience as the legislative session uh, comes to a close, as you say, perhaps five weeks. Are there any major issues with renewable energy that you could shed some light on that folks are really pushing for, whether it's incremental change or, or something like that, that would help facilitate these industries' growth over the next seven or eight years? We have not gotten the um, presentation on the revenue side. Usually it's tax credits uh, that provide uh, some uh, impetus. Uh, there also are uh, perhaps um, we'll see uh, 
some capital uh, support for certain kinds of um, planning for local communities. Uh, it's, I, I can't say that we have, uh, that I'm aware yet, perhaps in the next day or so, I'll be more aware of incentives that uh, could be um, out there. The, some of it is about permitting and under, you know, moving, uh, making it easier to get a permit. Uh, but we do have a substantial amount of offshore energy in the works. But their responsibility is to get the energy to the shore. That's why I said transmission lines are key. And we do have some transmission projects underway, uh, but they are, um, you know, not coming online in the next year or so. So that those are difficulties. So everybody, you know, got their knickers in a twist over um, losing their gas stove, not happening uh, immediately. But I will say that for some time, most new uh, construction has had uh, electric stoves in it uh, because in many places uh, it's easier than running a gas line. The electric is going to be there because you're going to need your lights uh, and in some more rural places you need uh, a electricity for your pump to get the water out of your well or your spring and so um, houses that have been built uh, around the state uh, maybe not in New York City that is full of underground um, uh, gas lines, but in other places, it was always easier uh, to have uh, electricity run because you're going to have to run it even for basic um, uh, lighting. So it's there's no question that the opposition is the fossil fuel industry, and they are very effective at throwing up scare tactics on the one hand, and on the other, obfuscating for the last 30 years about the impact of climate change. So people have to remember where those messages are coming from. They're coming from the people who uh, knew that there was something wrong, knew that there were negative impacts, and spent a lot of time uh, on junk science to undermine what real scientists knew was happening uh, in the same way that the tobacco industry um, knew exactly how pernicious their product was, uh, but uh, obfuscated and denied and um, essentially killed people. So we're going to uh, have to put up with a lot of uh, incoming that is not accurate information, and we're going to have to push back. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Assemblymember Glick's counterpart is chair of the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee, Pete Harkum. Uh, Pete is a, a, a friend and a former colleague uh, who is um, shown tremendous leadership already in running the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee. He couldn't be here personally today, but recorded a video for us. Uh, so without further ado, uh, from the northern suburbs of New York City and chair of the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee, please uh, watch this video from Senator Peter Harkum. Hi, everyone. This is New York State Senator Pete Harkum, chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Environmental Conservation. I want to thank John Parker and all of you at the Bar Association Environment Committee for being here in Albany today. I am so sorry I cannot be with you personally. I would love to be. Believe me, we are knee deep uh, in budget in the final negotiations. So unfortunately, I can't be with you. I want to thank you for your interest in public policy and for your advocacy. It's so important right now. On Earth Day, our planet is so imperiled, whether choking on plastics, whether it's climate change, whether it's threats to our water, whether it's threats to our children through chemicals and pesticides. The landscape changes every day, no pun intended. So I want to thank you for your interest in these issues. 
I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I promise you once the budget's done any other time you want to get together, I'm happy to see you. Thank you all so much. Happy Earth Day. I've actually never seen a video before where someone still had their bag on their shoulder, but it shows you uh, how busy uh, this time of year is. And as someone who is a former elected official, um, I think it's really interesting to note that when attorneys such as, you know, the party assembled here, and my, myself now included, are dealing with these issues, we're really focused on very specific parts of a bill, key words, phrases, that's our job as attorneys to dig into that. But a lot of times we're talking to elected officials who have to deal with 10 or 11 different subjects in a day and may only have a passing knowledge of what you're talking about. Um, and so I think your um, role in telling them how your clients or how your interest in the law is impacted by what's happening is really important. So this isn't really pertaining to any particular thing. And I'll talk about the CLCPA and what's happening with that law in action right now. But I do first want to say that um, I've been in many conversations where people are talking to me really in the weeds about stuff. And I have to had to stop and say, like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Like, back up a second. Um, and not many people will. People will just nod at your head and say, really nice to meet you and move on. So just be aware that, um, you know, someone just had a conversation about higher education. They just had a conversation about, um, you know, a, a family that doesn't think its child is getting proper special education for their dyslexic son or daughter. They're talking about the hospital and what medical equipment they need or what cuts they're having. And then you're going talking to them about paragraph C4 of a recycling bill that they like may have signed on to in the middle of the night or something. So just be aware that uh, for that very reason, it's important you're there and in front of their face to help make clear to them what some of the issues are with these bills. And it's not so simple, but also take a step back and, and try to orient elected officials in terms of where they are. And you just saw Senator Harkum there who had one minute with a bag on his shoulder to record a video for us today on his way to probably doing something completely different. Um, so in 2019, uh, New York State passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. I was proud to be one of the sponsors of that bill. Uh, it was a really interesting thing that doesn't happen that often where the governor, the assembly and the Senate all work together during session to have what's called a three-way agreement as opposed to the legislature just passing something and giving it to the governor to sign or veto, we actually, I think when it became, and here's some of the inside politics, when I think it became very clear to the Cuomo administration that this was going to happen, they made a decision with a few weeks to go in session that it's gonna happen with them and that they wanted their input in it and not really be forced in a, in a veto or sign um, position. And so it was a really interesting discussion. Some things I thought should happen didn't happen in the bill. Some things I wanted to happen did. Uh, we had tremendous staff working on it. A lot of the people that are working on it are doing important things in energy and, and space now. Um, but what I think this next panel and what a lot of you are working on in your daily lives are trying to figure out is what does the CLCPA mean in action? Um, and um, are the goals going to be reachable? And if they are reached, how is that going to be done? And how is the transition possible getting citizen buy-in? And um, I think some of the early things we've seen are, are telling, and it's, it's, not, it's not simple. It's a complicated story. And I'll give you my perspective on this. And I think I've got an interesting perspective because I'm defensive as someone who wrote it, but now I am advocating as someone who represents clients and wants to see um, industry succeed and good things happen and make sure that well-meaning people that want to invest in New York are heard. So I think I've seen it from some different sides. And what I could tell you right now is the challenges are, are real. But one thing I'm proud of is the promise that if you build it, they will come is really true. You know, when you say we must reach these goals, it sends a signal to the world that New York is open for business. Um, Assembly member Glick said something interesting, like we all have to do our part. So don't just ignore that we contribute X to the world greenhouse gases. So why should we have this big ambitious law? Part of that gamble was about wanting to be on the ground floor of a green economy, right? You want to be one of the first states that builds out a workforce that companies invest in and establish headquarters in and, and um, put a footprint on the ground. 
And that's happening. I mean, never before in my life was I talking to German companies and Korean companies and French companies and on and on. I mean, every big and not so big player in the world is coming to New York, whether you're someone who wants to ferry workers from the shore to a wind turbine, whether you want to be one of the big providers of energy building transmission, they all know that New York, it's worth spending time and investing here because New York said, we got to do this. Let's go. That's, that's real. I think the harder and more difficult part is getting from here to there and saying, okay, now I want to build this. How easy is this going to be for me? And it's turning out to be, to be uh, a little bit ch challenging. And you'll hear from the next panel coming up that um, government is trying to move fast, but in a lot of ways, not fast enough that um, some incentives should be there or but have not materialized yet. Although I will say just an aside, I think the Bond Act coming online this year is gonna be a really big deal. Uh, we're talking about billions of dollars that are gonna be invested in projects for, for clean energy, uh, for resiliency, for shoreline restoration, for a lot of important things for the environment. I think that's gonna be a big catalyst for a lot of the work that we will all do um, and that will help help the state uh, tremendously. And by the way, I, I do want to give, um, you know, uh, those who put this program together a lot of credit. You know, this has traditionally been a heavily environmentally centered panel uh, and discussion on days like this that I was proud to be a part of as a legislator. Focusing on the energy, I really think is where is the discussion that New York is having right now. Um, how are we going to um, build out the tremendous amount of solar and wind that the CLCPA says we're going to do? And when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, what are we going to do? How much storage can we build? How fast can we build it is a, is a very important topic. And you're going to hear from uh, Key Capture Energy as part of the panel today about some of the challenges they're facing and the goals they have, among others. Uh, and then there's a really big debate of whether you could have a different molecule. Can it be hydrogen? Can it be renewable natural gas? What are you going to do when you don't have the dispatchable when you don't have the dispatchable energy? And that is a, a fiercely raging debate right now in New York. You have some hardcore advocates and frankly many legislators who say, uh-uh, anything that involves using a pipeline or any type of combustion at all is bad, can't happen in the state. It's just a way for fossil fuels to perpetuate what they've been doing for a long time, not happening. Then you obviously have on the way other side, um, mostly in the in the minority parts of the legislature, people saying, what are you doing? We can't scale down so fast. Let's do as much of this as we can. And then there's a middle ground, which is, all right, we probably need some other molecule. Let's find which is the um, best, most efficient uh, use while we're decarbonizing and scaling down at the same time, not with any, what I would argue is a nefarious purpose of trying to per perpetuate fossil fuel use, just saying, look, we need reliability. And when you want to turn all this stuff, you know, it's, it's funny, it's not always the same people that are building one thing while the others want to turn this stuff down and they have to work with each other. So while you're taking energy offline, you got to be building up energy here. And the two, you know, the government's supposed to be looking at both at the same time. And you're going to hear from Chair Rory Christian today, and that's his main job. But the sides you hear from often are not those same people. So yes, everyone is anxious to turn out, turn off power plants, which coming from a community that has a big one, I certainly understand that argument at its core. But how fast are you going to scale up different forms of um, cleaner energy so that you have reliability is really important. And one of the things I think people forget a lot is that citizen buy-in is critical and we haven't asked citizens to make tough decisions yet. And how fast and how hard you want that to be, I think is really important. Um, you know, people ask me when the law first started, so you're saying in 2050, no one is going to have a boiler in their house? No one is going to have a, a stove? No one's going to have, how, how can that be? And there are really two visions of how this goes right there is technology gets better the state gives incentives people buy in you use the period you have over time to slowly get there and then there's the dystopian vision of excuse me sir i'd like to go in your boiler room and see what you got in there right like that can't happen um so making sure that first vision is realized is really important and yes we have 
decades to get there, but it goes really fast and you see some of these decisions coming up really quickly. This year's scoping report I thought was really interesting. It's supposed to give a roadmap of how we're going to get from here to there. Uh, it was it was a really important endeavor. I thought you had some really smart people working on it. But it you know, I think those who worked on it will in fairness tell you that it is just a plan. Right? It is not a mandate. Some of it will become uh, become regulation. Some of it legislators will have to carry over the finish line. Uh, and some of it uh, is just going to help guide state actors in kind of a little bit of an amorphous way that you're not really sure what it means. Just, uh, you know, guiding decisions, whether they be permitting decisions or or what have you. So it's, re it's really interesting. And I think the last thing I want to leave you with is almost like the Constitution in a way, you know, the law is this, and I'll say this as one of the authors, it's not two tablets handed down by God, as much as I think highly of myself. Um, you know, th these, th it set broad goals, it definitely gave some regulatory guidance, but a lot of it is up to those actors uh, in government and that inform policy to help figure out how to get there. And it is very much a breathing document that doesn't mean you can do anything you want to it the goals are really important those are really set in stone and that was what it was about but how we're going to figure out how to go to a green and clean energy economy while keeping the lights on is the name of the game and having an open mind about how to do that i think is really important um, and you who practice in this space are an incredibly important part of figuring out how to do that um, and many of the answers have not been found and so i'll leave you with this before i call up the next panel um, when we passed the law, we had a few panels around the state where we asked experts from MIT all the way to random people, citizens who would show up and want to speak questions of, you know, how do you get from here to there? And I would always ask a question as many times as I could, tell us what we know now, what we don't know, and whether we can get there. And, and honest people would say, all right, in the transportation sector, we don't have the technology right now to get there or in the building sector we're not there yet but we see ways where prices come down technology in, improves government invests and over 20 years i bet you we could do it and i think people have kind of forgotten that uh, which is we were kind of building the airplane while flying it we had no choice but to do it we were already late when we started um, but helping inform that decision is not bad Right, and I think right now people trying to figure out how to get from here to there sometimes are seen as monkeying in the process. My view is that's what's supposed to happen. Right, we're trying to figure out how to get from here to there. We're looking for companies to give us guidance on what they could do, how fast they could do it, and we want them to do it here in New York and not forget that they can go a lot of other places. So, um, I firmly still believe in the endeavor we're on, but we got to do it smartly. And having this panel today focus on this issue is critical. This is what is going to be in front of government decision makers for years to come and having um, a speaker like chair Rory Christian today is just amazing because he is sitting right in the nexus of all of these decisions having to figure out how to reach our goals while uh, ensuring reliability in the state it's no easy feat he's got competing voices in his head every day and it's in my opinion great to have such sound leadership in that position right now but certainly leadership who should be hearing from us all the time so without further ado i'm going to call john parker back up here it's been a privilege to address you from this side of things and um i wish you a, a, a success as you continue the day We're just taking a moment as I flag everybody to come up for the panel so we can we can start. Um, okay, excellent.
Okay, everybody. Um, welcome again. My name is John Parker. I've had the opportunity to serve for the last several years as the chair of this uh, legislation committee um, and this legislative forum. As uh, Senator Kaminsky and the Assemblywoman Click noted, uh, we really expanded and are covering issues that are the issues that are, are the pressing key decision making points that will change and alter the future uh, for generations to come. So I welcome you. I think that the notion of what's going on here, which the context I'll bring now, is part of the reason why this event has grown to a, a regional, uh, national, and now international focus. Folks around the country and around the world are interested in what's happening here. And the folks that are leading the charge are on this panel. So we are in a period of great change. It isn't overstated to say that. Extreme weather is something that has become more commonplace. As a person who stood in California during one of the atmospheric rivers and watched folks have a snowball fight at the Hollywood sign, I can assure you, I did not expect that to be a Southern California moment. Nor did I think folks there appreciate hundreds of inches of snow returning the snowpack. These are not normal events. In addition, places along New York's coastline, we have hundreds of miles of beautiful coastline, as I'm sure everybody here knows, and folks from out of state, I can assure you, they're quite spectacular areas. But they too are now talking about what we need to do to be resilient and change as sea level rise changes, changes local communities, changes access to areas that we always thought would be places we could go. So with that context, New York state laws we've just heard uh, from one of the authors and from leaders currently tackling these issues, um, New York state law has set important goals to meet the climate challenge. And it's changing the future of the energy industry in this state. You've heard mention of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. There are a lot of folks watching this and in this room that are very well versed in those provisions of law. But there are others who aren't. So let's just do a snapshot as we transition here. The goals in the law are profound an 85% reduction of emissions by 2050, a 40% reduction uh, by 2030, and 100% emission-free electrical sector by 2040. Now, 2030, 2040, and 2050 seems like, oh, some time in the future, but it's arriving rapidly. So we've brought legislators today to talk about those issues. That's the context. The legislators have set the agenda and set the goals, but it's the professional and industry leaders that are implementing these new energy technologies. Later on, as we've heard, we have a key regulator that's helped facilitate this as our keynote. And I look forward to everybody joining us for that as well. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our panelists individually each will have a presentation about some of the key points they'd like to raise we'll go one by one and at the end we'll have a, a conversation that way i think we can give everybody the due respect they've they've earned um, and i don't want to get lost in introductions because um, being on the on the forefront of a changing world um, is a big deal so along with our agenda the panel discussion we've called meeting the challenges of new york's energy future a discussion of key sectors of this new energy economy. Our first speaker is Phil Denara. He's a senior manager of development at Key Capture Energy. Key Capture Energy is a developer, owner, and operator of utility scale energy storage with the largest operational battery energy system in New York at 20 megawatts, known as the KCE New York One facility. That's a mouthful. It's in Stillwater. Phil and his team work to identify and vet strategic development locations, manage the design and local permitting process, oversees interconnection studies through the New York ISO process, 
and pursues commercial opportunities for his projects. Key, key Capture Energy is currently developing approximately one gigawatt of battery energy storage projects throughout New York, which includes multiple sites on Long Island. In 2019, Mr. Uh, Phil joined um, Key Capture after completing his master's in business administration in sustainable business practices from the University of Oregon. Phil, welcome. Thank you. I'd like to turn to you just for a minute to do your presentation. Let's, let's do it that way. Um, let me see if I can facilitate that. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks, John, um, for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, thank you to Senator Kaminsky for uh, laying the foundation and, and setting the stage um, for this important topic. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here today. Um, and in addition to sharing some more about um, our specific um, development and operational initiatives within the state, I'm also just generally looking forward to learning from some of our, my fellow panel, panel members today. Um, the, it takes an army to transition a electric grid and support sustainable initiatives. And uh, it's really easy to get lost in your day-to-day your -day, um, corner of the world. Um, so it's really exciting to, to present to you on what we're working on here at Key Capture, but also just learn from, from others in the field as well. I'm trying to figure out where I need to point this. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so as, as John noted, um, I was formerly senior manager and just recently uh, promoted to director of development for, for Key Capture Energy. So I oversee our New York initiatives and, and team. Um, Key Capture Energy uh, KCE was founded in 2016 as a utility scale energy storage company. So we're involved in everything from early stage origination and development of sites uh, to procurement of the technologies, construction and contracting of the facilities, and actually uh, owning and operating the facilities as well. So we have a, uh, we go as far to have a, a software optimization team that is actually creating algorithms for how these projects are dispatched into markets to figure out how they most benefit the grid. Um, we're actually headquartered right here in Albany, um, just around the corner um, on Monroe Street. Uh, we are in a disadvantaged community, um, and we also have offices in, in Houston and Salt Lake City. Um, we're about an 80 person team at this point um, with a significant portion of the team based in Albany um, and we are partnered with SUNY Albany through the New York startup program. Um, so really excited to be working closely with the, the SUNY system. We hire interns and, and full time employees from the SUNY system, um, myself included. I was uh, actually a graduate in my undergrad from some from SUNY Albany. Um, we currently have about 600 megawatts of projects in construction or operations in the, in the U.S. As Senator Kaminsky mentioned, it's really about market creation. Um, if, you, if you build it, they will come. Um, and that's a, a testament to the successes that we've had in, in New York um, and other markets where, where there's um, enough advancement to um, facilitate and deploy energy storage. Um, in New York specifically, we've got 44 megawatts of battery energy storage and operations in the construction and upwards of a, a thousand megawatts in the development pipeline. Um, and since 2021, we have been owned by Paskey, which is beneficially owned by SKENS, which is a multinational South Korean conglomerate. Um, as uh, Senator Kaminsky also mentioned, um, it's a multinational investment um, that takes full buy-in and, and capital from all around the world um, to deploy clean energy at scale. Um, so um, SK has been a, a great partner for us and it's been a, a pleasure to work with them um, and, and, and demonstrates the commitment made by, by them and, and others from around the globe, 
Globe and the investments that they're making here in New York. Um, so I'm going to you know, present a, a few, uh, a bit of information about some of the projects that we have online and then talk about some of the issues that we're facing as well as the, some of the things that we're excited about specific to energy storage. Um, so um, this is the KC New York One facility that John mentioned. It's a 20 megawatt, 20 megawatt hour facility. So as you think about energy storage and battery storage particularly, you have to think about the power output, which is the megawatt, but also the duration of that storage. So in this case, this is a short duration, one hour project, um, and it's mainly providing frequency regulation on the grid. So um, short uh, discharges and charges of power um, reacting extremely um, quickly and responsive to energy to maintain frequency, in this case, 60 hertz on the electric grid. Um, so it's supporting near, nearby industrial loads and responding to real-time fluctuations to, to support the local electric grid. It's located in, in Saratoga, Saratoga County in, in Stillwater. Um, and, you know, as noted on the screen, um, is committed to investing more than $160,000 in the community. Um, I'll also note that it's, you know, as part of battery energy storage specifically, it's really interesting to see how technology has progressed over time. Um, some of these initial systems dating back to 2019, you could actually walk into the container. Um, it was, it was otherworldly. You, you'd walk in, you'd see the battery racks and you could touch and, and see everything. Um, nowadays, as technology pr improves, especially uh, for battery storage so rapidly, um, we're seeing, you know, more power and energy dense systems moving towards cabinet type systems where you can't actually enter the facility. So uh, energy density is improving, it's getting safer, um, et cetera, as, as this industry develops. And it's really interesting to see that happen in real time and deploy some of these projects at scale. Our next facility is uh, New York 3, uh, which has been operational since 2020. Uh, this project was contracted with Orange and Rockland Utilities as what's called the non-wires alternative. So essentially, Orange and Rockland had identified thermal overloads on their grid as they projected uh, electricity, electricity demand increases over time and determined that it was cost effective to deploy an energy storage project at a local substation instead of building transmission. Um, so, you know, you avoid the, the costly impact to ratepayers from that transmission um, and the visual and other consideration involved with that. Um, so Key Capture built the project and transferred ownership to Orange and Rockland, and then has a multi-year operations and maintenance contract associated with it. Um, and this is our, our last project, which is actually still in the commissioning phase, but this is a New York Six facility in Blaisdell, just outside of Buffalo. This is a 20 megawatt, 80 megawatt hour facility, so a four hour duration in this case, and received um, the, uh, uh, an incentive from the NYSERDA Market Bridge Incentive Program, which was the full, first bulk storage incentive program in the state. Um, it is currently in the commissioning phase and will be operational later this year. So why are we here and, and why are we invested, um, uh, you know, especially with, with storage? Um, you know, the sun is not always shining, the wind is not always blowing, we're going to need um, also, you know, alternatives to support a uh, reliable grid and support the integration of renewables. So um, as laid out in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, there's a goal of 70% renewables by 2030 and 100% by 2040. As part of that, there's a mandate for 1500 megawatts of storage by 2025 and 3000 megawatts by 2030 which was actually doubled to six gigawatts by 2030 by Governor Hochul during her state of the state in January of 2022. Um, as part of that mandate, utilities must procure energy storage similar to the ONR contract for the non-wires alternative. Um, NYSERDA offers incentive programs and contracts as well, and there may be other bilateral commercial agreements uh, offered to, to, by the market to incentivize storage. Um, you know, looking forward in, ter in terms of how we get there, um, just recently, in December of 2022, NYSERDA and the DPS um, filed to the PSC their, uh, what I call the Roadmap 2.0 program. This is their updated program for outlining how storage gets to where we need to be by 2030 and beyond. As part of that filing, uh, the supporting analysis states that we may need as much as 12 gigawatts of storage by 2040 and 16 gigawatts looking beyond that to 2050. Um, when you think about an electric grid today that has a peak demand in the 30 
one gigawatt range um, and installed capacity in the state of, of 40 to 45 gigawatts. That's a pretty significant percentage of the potential total installed capacity that storage might be uh, part of um, in the future. So as we think about reliability and integration of renewables, clearly the analysis and, and those involved do believe that storage will have a crucial component to play in that. Um, as part of that filing, there's a, an updated procurement roadmap that includes um, uh, 3,000 megawatts of procurements by NYSERDA um, by 2030, and also for the bulk storage projects that KeyCapture is primarily focused on, um, but also um, 1,500 megawatts of incentives for the retail program, which is a slightly smaller scale, as well as residential solar as well. Um, I also want to note that you know storage is deployed at, at various scales, so we are primarily focused on the bulk scale. Um, there's also incentives for, for retail and, and residential as well. Um, so one thing that I did want to note was uh, FERC Order 2022, which was approved in 2020, and requires system operators like the New York Independent System Operator, which manages the wholesale electricity grid to enable distributed energy resources, such as rooftop solar and batteries on your homes, um, battery energy storage systems on commercial and industrial facilities and, dis and aggregated energy throughout the grid to participate in wholesale markets. So, you know, as we look forward, we're, we're really going to have a really interconnected, responsive, communicated grid, um, and energy storage is going to play a crucial component of that. Um, some of the, the benefits of, of energy storage, which I, I've already noted, it enhances power reliability um, and serves as a non-wires alternative. So in addition to, to charging over longer periods of time and supporting the integration of renewables, it's also supporting ancillary services like frequency response, voltage regulation. Some of the things that a uh, capacitor within a substation or transmission lines today would provide, uh, energy storage can also support. Uh, supporting re uh, penetration of renewables, um, it's deferring transmission upgrades and it's servicing peak demand. Some of the, the benefits as we think about why uh, we can site these in, in residentially or urban uh, dense neighborhoods is, you know, it's a low, low noise profile, it's no emissions, it can be sited near existing electrical infrastructure and it's super energy dense. So as we think about siting offshore wind and large scale solar and wind that uh, predominantly need to be sited in, in large and vast areas, um, you can also utilize storage to, to be localized and, and serve peak demand within discrete areas of the grid that otherwise would not be able to serve by, by large scale renewables. Um, so, you know, jumping forward, uh, I just wanted to, to speak through some of the, the things that are, are top of mind for our industry. So uh, a lot of words on this page, but I, I break down our development cycle into you know, three major considerations. Um, it's interconnection, it's siting and permitting, and it's the market case and commercial component. How do these projects economically pencil? Um, developers must balance all of these timelines and, and typically they're under varying jurisdictions and, and not coordinated. So it's, it's essentially a juggling act of, you know, how do we plan strategically and, and budget accordingly for, for all of these things on multiple fronts to occur? And I'm gonna walk through, you know, some of the, some of the things that are, are top of mind for us within these three respective subjects. Um, you know, as you'll see in this, in this general schedule here, um, Development, uh, especially of utility scale storage, can, can take upwards of, of three to six years. So as we look at a mandate by 2030, we're talking about you know, developing and originating projects today. Um, we're talking about submitting interconnection requests to the New York Independent System Operator today. We're talking about NYSERDA rolling out procurement programs and incentive programs and, and contracting for those today because it takes time to to do that, to budget for it, to contract for it. Um, so from the market case and commercial perspective, um, it's, it's really hard to, to forecast out the economics of an electric market um, like New York. But, but today, um, the combined price signals do not necessarily result in revenue adequacy for, for, for bulk scale energy storage, retail energy storage. Um, so, uh, the, the, the two snippets on the right side of the page are actually taken directly from the, the um, Roadmap 2.0 filing. Um, so the, the top slide indicates 
the uh, deployed and contracted and awarded um, energy storage to date, which is roughly 1300 megawatts. Um, of that, uh, approximately 480 megawatts is from their, their bulk scale uh, market bridge incentive program, like the New York Six program uh, project I mentioned, um, as well as other procurements. Um, and then there's some smaller scale um, com commercial and industrial projects and, and non wires alternatives that are demonstration projects from the utilities. Um, and then moving forward, uh, the bottom image uh, essentially summarizes what NYSERDA is proposing in their filing which is um, you know, roughly 1,000 megawatts or more of, of procurement in 24, 25, and 26 for bulk storage programs. Um, additional incentives for the retail projects, which are roughly five megawatts or less in scale, as well as additional incentives for, for residential deployment. Um, so a, a couple of things to note here. You know, as, as I mentioned, the, the market signals today do not um, on their own merits justify storage deployment without some sort of incentive. So how is NYSERDA addressing that? Um, in their filing, they're proposing a index credit mechanism. So this would be periodic uh, competitive solicitations to procure bulk scale projects under long-term contracts. They would do that by developers bidding a strike price, which is then indexed against reference capacity and energy prices in the, the wholesale market. This is beneficial because um, incentives should ultimately allow for storage operation to change as grid needs and, and markets change. So as we have more intermittent renewables on the grid, um, you need additional grid services um, that storage can provide like those non-wires alternative, frequency regulation, voltage uplift, whatever it may be. So this, this contracting structure, which is indexed against um, the market, um, allows for developers to change how projects operate in order to best benefit the grid. Um, so as new wholesale market products are created, um, those, are, you know, those are accounted for against that index price. Um, so this contract structure seems to make a lot of sense. Um, I would also note that attrition is, is inevitable. Um, even after a project has received a contract or an award, it continues to carry risk. Um, you need to, to get those final permits. You need to work through interconnection studies. Um, you need to post security on those studies and, and, and track other macro risks, um, which, which are ultimately present. So, um, you know, as we uh, push towards these 2030 goals, um, I think it's really important that um, NYSERDA, DPS, and the PC, PSC uh, continue to account for attrition of, of certain projects and, and consider um, awarding additional projects beyond their target. Moving forward to interconnection. Um, so, you know, who were the three major parties involved with interconnecting energy storage, especially for the bulk scale side? Um, it's the New York Independent System Operator, the NISO, which is a, a nonprofit entity which um, oversees the electricity market. Um, uh, manages and administers all of the reliability and interconnection studies. Um, so as Senator Kaminsky noted, you know, you cannot decommission and retire incumbent fossil generation without adding additional installed capacity. And that is a sensitive balance and ensuring that we do that on appropriate timeline takes a lot of time and planning and input for multiple stakeholders. You have the respective transmission owners, which is your utility within your, your region. So there's, there's seven transmission owners throughout the state, National Grid, NYSEG, Central Hudson, RG&E, Con Edison, Orange and Rockland Utilities, and, and LIPO on Long Island. Um, each of them own and manage a specific portion of the state's transmission grid, but ultimately it's all interconnected, interconnected and involved at, at multiple um, inflection points. And then you have independent power producers like ourselves, Key Capture Energy, which are actually responsible for deploying um, energy solutions at scale. In this case, Key Capture would be deploying the storage, which would be connected to the local transmission owner's grid, but ultimately administered by the NISO through the electricity market. So what are some considerations from the, the interconnection side of things? One. Uh, developers uh, often do not have clear expectations of the final cost allocations and potential issues associated with delivering that energy to the grid until very late in the process. So how do we resolve this? Um, it's, it's recommended that we implement procurement cost sharing mechanisms so that the risk is not fully worn by developers. This will ultimately improve bid integrity 
and limit developers from under overbidding as a response to this uncertainty. Um, this is really important. As you think about the electric grid and studies um, and a clean energy transition that's going to occur in a very short period of time, um, there are oftentimes very significant transmission upgrades associated with unbottling that, that capacity, ensuring deliverability of renewables. And without cost sharing mechanisms or appropriate rate based transmission projects, with, which Chair Glick noted to, um, developers may actually wear that, that risk and have to pay for those upgrades and incorporate that into their pricing. Um, so how can we figure out how to share that proportionally throughout the state to ensure that it's a, an equitable and, and just transition and investment? Um, interconnection study delays posed as a significant uh, risk to the New York State goals. Um, it, as this transition happens really quickly, um, and is often the case, you, you go from one to, to two new uh, interconnection applications per year over the last couple of decades to all of a sudden thousands of new projects being considered. And that means that the NISO and, and other folks that are studying the grid are, are inundated with applications. So, so how do we address that? Um, it's, a, it's a complicated and nuanced question, but the NISO is actively evaluating process improvements and reform and soliciting feedback from stakeholders to ensure that um, as we move through the study phases of the interconnection process, there's, there's full buy-in and a strategic approach. And then, you know, as I noted, in, in certain uh, regions of New York, particularly New York City and Long Island and the downstate region, um, there are significant deliverability upgrades associated with those projects. Um, and it's important that the industry continues to advocate for local transmission investment from the transmission owners um, and considers um, public policy transmission needs, which are rate based across the state or to specific regions for transmission upgrades to, to host that capacity. And, and finally, just briefly want to touch on, on siting and permanent considerations. Um, currently, energy storage is subject to local entitlement processes. So unlike uh, environmental and review and permitting of, of major energy facilities like large scale solar and wind, which is administered by a single forum, in this case, the or Office of Renewable Energy Siting, um, all storage is still permitted through the local municipal process. Um, so it's really important that NYSERDA and other stakeholders continue to advocate for proactive zoning and analysis and reforms because the last thing we want is to approach the town with the project that's being contemplated. Um, and then when you finally go to submit an application a couple of years later, have them um, adopt a moratorium because they feel that they need to revise their code or consider additional implications involved with that application. Um, NYSERDA has released a, a model law, which is essentially the procedural framework for residential, commercial, and utility scale energy storage. Um, so that is online and completely referenceable um, and something that we, we try to get in the hands of, of local municipal leaders as soon as possible so that can, they consider the siting considerations for these projects. Um, and, and also just a, another plug, which I'll mention, um, energy storage technologies are, are not currently eligible for exemption from state sales tax and use taxes. So today, all of our projects are currently negotiating typically a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes for all uh, three standardized exemptions being uh, property sales and, um, and, and, and tax uh, and use taxes um, for the projects. Um, but there is actually a bill on the floor right now and being considered as part of the budget process, um, which would ensure that standalone storage is eligible for state sales tax and use tax exemptions. This will reduce costs spur development and ensure that New York uh, all um, clean energy technologies are on the same level playing field, considering solar and fuel cells and, and other technologies benefit from this tax exemption today. Um, that's all I, I have for you. Um, hopefully did not jump too deep into the weeds, but presented a, somewhat of a, a, a picture of some of the, the things that we're working on across those, there's three fronts, um, as well as showing some of the, the demonstration projects that we've um, already brought online. Um, it, it's going to be really exciting to see how these projects continue to scale up and, and grow over time. And um, we're really excited to be here and invested in New York. So thank you all for your consideration and um, looking forward to the rest of the discussion today.
Phil, thank you for that. Uh, not too in the weeds presentation. It was awesome. There are a lot of issues that are interconnected, interrelated, and I think um, the battery storage with its interplay with local rules, local permitting, and significant investment uh, implications is a great example of it. So we'd like to move from battery energy storage systems to the next area for our conversation. And that is things, uh, the wind turbine and wind power industry. Um, folks in coastal areas, certainly Long Island, Maine and other areas are, are very well versed in, in what's going on. The process that is enabling um, both a new and additional projects. So I, I am pleased to announce that we have Josh Rulin with us. Josh is the Director of Permitting and Environmental Affairs at Equinor Wind US. He's a renewable energy leader, more than 15 years of experience as an attorney, consultant, and lead certified professional. Currently serves as Director of Permitting for a 2.1 gigawatt Empire Wind project being developed by Equinor, NBP, to provide power for more than 1 million homes in New York City that's Empire Wind 1, and on Long Island, which is Empire Wind 2. In this role with Equinor, Josh leads the team responsible for securing federal, state, and local permits for the wind farm, transmission systems, and substations for these two Empire Wind projects, as well as operations and maintenance space, wind energy staging port, and, at, and wind energy staging port, excuse me, at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Prior to his time serving with Equinor, Josh was an attorney in private practice, representing clients in permitting, environmental review, project consent and entitlement, land use, and other regulatory matters. He also served as a senior environmental and energy law subject matter expert for Thomson Reuters. And he also served as staff attorney and chief investigator for Hudson Riverkeeper. Josh is a 2007 graduate of Pace University Hobbs School of Law. He resides in Gardner, where he also serves in his free time on the town of Gardner Planning Board. We're very honored to have Josh Rosen with us today. Josh. Uh, thank, thanks, John. And uh, thank you to uh, the rest of my panel, fellow panelists uh, you know, I think hearing Phil kind of talk about the challenges with uh, energy storage and, you know, both challenges and opportunities, I, I hear a lot of similarities with uh, some of some of the both challenge, challenges and opportunities that, that face offshore wind in New York. And, you know, it's we didn't plan this out, but Phil finished with permitting and siting. Um, you know, I'm going to focus a lot on permitting and siting just because for offshore wind, uh, there is a a multitude of permits uh, from from the federal sort of umbrella that starts from the offshore wind leases that are, you know, fe federally owned uh, offshore property to New York State, and then depending on sort of where you're where you're coming ashore, also potentially local local permitting concerns uh, as well. So, just to give a, a very high level overview of uh, of Equinor's portfolio in the U.S. Um, we have two projects uh, that are in the sort of consenting and planning phase that are, uh, you know, Empire Wind 1 and 2 are looking to start construction as early as, uh, as next year with a sort of in-service target of sort of the middle to the end of the 2020s, so 2026, 2027, somewhere in that ballpark, although a lot of that is tied into sort of uh, permitting and construction that still is ahead of us. Uh, so um, between Empire Wind 1 and Empire Wind 2, which are located in the New York Bight, uh, you can see on the map it is sort of off in between uh, Long Island and New Jersey. Uh, we also have the Beacon Wind 1 project, which is offshore of, uh, of Massachusetts and sort of, uh, you know, 30 or 40 miles away from, from Montauk. Uh, Empire Wind 1 is uh, interconnecting into the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal at Sunset Park, uh, 816 megawatts. Uh, located directly next to that point of interconnection, that substation is going to be sort of our operations and maintenance base that will service all three projects, Empire One, Empire Two, and Beacon One, uh, as well as a staging port. So, uh, you know, there aren't currently sort of set up and operating any ports within the U.S. that sort of have the capacity to 
sort of manage the scale of the equipment that will be installed offshore. And I've got a slide coming up pretty soon where I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, so this operations and maintenance base next to the staging port. Staging port is actually being commissioned for the Equinor and BP projects. However, it is uh, ultimately owned by New York City, uh, New York City Economic Development Corporation. It will be an asset available for the offshore wind industry sort of going forward into the future. So one thing that I will touch upon as I sort of walk through the slides is that offshore wind uh, being so new and requiring uh, a sizable amount of infrastructure, we're, we're really building an industry as the projects sort of go through the consenting phase. There are very uh, few manufacturers in the US that are capable of, of sort of building the turbine foundations and equipment, but the industry is working very hard to sort of help subsidize, bring manufacturers that have facilities in Europe and other parts of the world to sort of build facilities in New York State, the tri-state area, and ultimately, you know, as the federal government opens up leasing rounds in other areas, including the West Coast off of California, there's going to need to be a, a supply chain that supplies offshore wind projects, you know, from coast to coast if we are to meet sort of both the uh, uh, goals of the Biden administration for 30 gigawatts by 2030 on the federal level. And, you know, on the New York state level, it's currently a nine gigawatt total um, between Empire One and Two and Beacon One. We have 3.3 gigawatts, so that's a little bit more than a third. Um, so just moving on, um, uh, Empire Wind 2 interconnecting in, in uh, Long Island, coming ashore in Long Beach. It's uh, right in Senator Kamitsky's uh, former district. Um, so know him well from uh, working with him and his staff around this project. And then Beacon Wind 1, although the lease area is off of Massachusetts, we're actually running a cable that's a little bit more than 200 miles along the entirety of the North Shore of Long Island and, and uh, connecting in Astoria, Queens. So here is a little bit of, uh, of context of what a offshore wind wind turbine generator or WTG is sort of sized in comparison to, you have the Statute of Liberty at roughly 300 feet. Uh, Empire's turbines, which are 15 megawatts per turbine, uh, roughly 820 feet. So not quite as tall as the Empire State Building, but certainly quite massive. Uh, this shows what our sort of foundations will look like. Uh, the top right-hand side is a photo of Equinor's uh, sort of main office outside of Oslo, Norway, and I hit this button. Here you see what the foundations for the turbines look like if they were overlaid over top of this building. Uh, we have a photo, I believe this is from Paulsboro, New Jersey, where the one sort of facility that's starting to manufacture foundations for offshore wind for some of the other developers uh, is rolling steel as we speak for some of these foundations. This shows sort of the size in comparison uh, to workers on site. So a little bit more about the, uh, actually before, before I get too much further into the projects, let me just talk a, a little bit about, about Equinor. Um, so Equinor has been around for uh, 50 years. They are a multinational corporation headquartered in Norway, uh, formerly known as Stat Oil. Um, they are majority owned by the Norwegian government, but publicly traded company with operations all over the world. Uh, currently, Equinor is uh, in the construction phase for the Dogger Bank wind farm off of the United Kingdom, which is the largest offshore wind farm that has sort of entered the construction phase at 3.6 gigawatts. Uh, there's a lot of experience within the company with offshore exploration, drilling, platforms, things of that nature. And so, uh, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who are, have been very happy to sort of make the transition uh, from sort of pure oil and gas into uh, offshore wind. I think that there is an ambition for other types of energy becoming a more diverse energy company. So uh, some of the other things that were mentioned, things like green, green hydrogen are certainly on the radar, um, as well as sort of expanding the footprint of electrical generation storage and things of that nature. So going back to uh, Empire Wind One, of those very large turbines that I showed a moment ago, uh, Empire Wind One, which is powering uh, New York City, has 57 of them. Um, the rotor diameter, which is sort of from tip to tip of the blades, is 232 meters. So they're roughly 600 feet each. So across, you have almost 600 feet across. Um, there's a blade testing facility in Massachusetts where some of the developers sort of, or uh, turbine manufacturers test these blades and they are quite, quite a sight to be seen. Um, they will be brought in by, by boat primarily. So you're not having to worry about sort of fitting them through New York City streets or streets in Long Island. Um, we will have an offshore converter station, so all of the power 
uh, from the 57 turbines in Empire One and up to 90 on Empire Wind Two will be brought to uh, sort of a collecting point with uh, with the offshore substations that will be built. Uh, then these are all wired up together with what are called interarray cables. So there are you know miles of cables offshore that connect all all the turbines together before it's collected up at the substation. Uh, for Empire One, we have roughly 75 kilometers of uh, export cable from our lease area. When we get within three nautical miles of New, York's, New York State, uh, that is where state jurisdiction kicks in. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of uh, Article 7, which is the New York State uh, high voltage transmission siting, siting process. Uh, each one of our Empire projects is covered by one big federal permit, but separate state permitting processes. Um, I think I already mentioned staging ports uh, in Brooklyn, and the project sort of has an operational lifetime of, of 30 plus years. Empire One was awarded a, a contract from NYSERDA in 2019 under the first offshore wind solicitation. Empire Wind Two and Beacon One were awarded through New York Two offshore wind solicitation, and those contracts were signed in 2022. So one of the major things that enables sort of construction of these major projects is the offshore wind sort of mechanism within New York State, which I, th I think is by far one of the one of the best sort of uh, mature systems within the US. There are other states that are working very hard and have very lofty goals for offshore wind as well. However, having NYSERDA as sort of a, a central point to help sort of direct the market through these competitive solicitations is a, a major plus for sort of building projects in New York. So I, I know I've sort of touched on this off and on, but here are some a little bit more details. So within New York City in Sunset Park, there is a, a roughly 73 acre site that's been uh, largely vacant for, for a number of decades. Um, it is right next to the industry city complex, which are a number of old sort of World War II level uh, uh, era warehouses that have been converted into mixed use. And um, you know the community for, for years was asking for something to come to Brooklyn that would contribute to more of a working class green jobs type of economy as opposed to uh, office buildings and hotels that have been uh, you know, built up quite a bit in New York City over the decades. Areas um, that had been industrial have been turned primarily into uh, more kind of luxury areas and have not necessarily supported uh, working class jobs, union jobs, things of that nature. So there was a fairly large upswell of support to New York City and New York State for a use such as offshore wind to come to Sunset Park and you know when, when Equinor was successful in the New York uh, NYSERDA, NYSERDA bid, uh, we have been able to sort of start working towards making this uh, a, a reality. So this will be one of the largest, if not the largest uh, port offshore wind port facilities uh, in the US. Uh, we are working very closely with our landlords at New York City Environmental Development, uh, Economic Development Corporation, as well as the community and various stakeholders to sort of design this to both be a center for Equinor's projects in the US, but also for offshore wind sort of going into the future. Focusing back in on the permitting aspect, if you look at this graphic, this sort of shows where the different jurisdiction goes. So you have local jurisdiction, which is generally just the onshore portion uh, with Empire Wind 1. New York City local permitting uh, applies to the upgrades to the port to the port project, uh, applies to the operations and maintenance base. Um, the onshore substation falls under state jurisdiction with Article 7. So you see the state jurisdiction is from three nautical miles. So our transmission lines, when they get closer into shore, uh, sort of fall under New York State's jurisdiction uh, for that siting process. And then on the federal side, it basically covers everything from the wind turbines all the way up to the point of interconnection. This gives sort of a, an overview of the umbrella of the different uh, permitting regimes that offshore wind sort of has to go through. On the federal side, we have a review from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for Section 404 uh, and Section 10 permits uh, for uh, pile driving, installing bulkhead upgrades, as well as laying the cables in the subsea. Uh, the main federal process, which triggers uh, the National Environmental Policy Act review, is called the COP, or Construction and Operations Plan. So that's sort of the, the big environmental sort of study document that is prepared by a developer, then BOEM issues an environmental impact statement and goes through 
sort of a review that is, that is a fa fairly typical NEPA type review or, or what would be a seeker type review uh, in New York. We also have to get uh, authorizations from the National Marine Fisheries for any sort of activities that would disturb marine mammals or endangered species. So that's the letter of authorization or LOA. And then the FDR and FIR are the uh, fabrication and installation aspect. So that used to be part of BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, this is now part of BESI, which is the federal sort of offshore safety uh, safety agency. So. BESI regulates, makes sure that all of the offshore sort of components meet all of the engineering and safety standards and ultimately sort of gives the final stamp of approval on all the technical engineering details. Stateside, as I mentioned, we have Article 7 leading to the Environmental Management and Construction Plan, which is sort of the state equivalent of the technical filings. Um, and then we have city, city and local ordinances for uh, demolishment of buildings um, on the SBMT site. Uh, Speedy's permit with DEC for discharges related to construction and uh, stormwater management and then building permits from New York City. So uh, I've, I've heard tell from my uh, New York City permit manager, we may have as many as 200 New York City permits just for the local uh, port upgrades. So suffice it to say, there's a lot of permits and it takes a really, really long time and a lot of coordination to not just get all your permits, but try to keep them all lined up so you don't get a permit for one thing from the feds that doesn't line up with uh, your, what you're getting on the state side. So another illustration, this is just for the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal showing sort of the overlapping jurisdiction between the various permitting processes. So as I mentioned, you have the construction operations plan on the federal side overlaid with the Article 7 process, the Army Corps of Engineers. There is a separate Army Corps permit for the port upgrade project because it is actually what's known as a connected action under NEPA. So our Empire project covers Empire 1, Empire 2, plus all the interconnections and our substation. The port, the permit applicant is actually New York City because they will own the port. And you know, ostensibly once Equinor sort of leases up, if there are not further projects to be built, it could be leased to another developer. So uh, Empire and Equinor are supporting New York City's permitting of this facility, but they are the applicants. In order to sort of make sure we don't have any NEPA segmentation issues, all of these, uh, the port project is actually considered an, a connected action under NEPA. So there's a full environmental analysis of the port upgrade that's tied into the full federal review uh, for the project as a whole. As if this wasn't complicated enough, we also have a brownfield program cleanup under the state BCP program, which is at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal covering both our substation site and the port area. Um, I think that covers most of it, but um, there are roughly 16 of us on our permitting team uh, have a whole sort of cadre of environmental consultants and experts as well as a lot of legal support. So it takes, it takes a, a, a very, very large team just within consenting to sort of move all these various pieces forward. This sort of shows the timeline. Uh, Equinor acquired the lease in 2017, had several years of surveys just out in the lease area to sort of characterize the subsea as well as um, marine species that are in the area. When you win a federal lease, you don't necessarily know very much about what's sort of in, in the ocean in the area that you just won your, your lease for. So there's a lot of work that has to go, be done Geotechnical, geophysical surveys, you have to look for uh, shipwrecks, historic resources, uh, marine mammals. So, so there is a, a, an enormous amount of survey work that has to happen before you even sort of move into permitting. Um, as I mentioned, the contract for Empire One was in 2019. We started the federal permitting kind of in 2020, have some Article 7 submissions for Empire One and Empire Two. And if we're lucky, we will get to a conclusion early in 2024 on the federal side. We are hopeful on the state side, although we are in settlement negotiations and we can never predict how long those will take in an Article 7, but we're hopeful that Empire Wind 1 will, will reach a joint proposal in, in those proceedings uh, sometime before the end of this year, hopefully much sooner than that. And uh, Empire Wind 2, we are hopeful we will sort of reach that conclusion at, at some point in 2024, although I'd, I'd be uh, uh, remiss to actually predict how, how long that may take. We have a about a three mile onshore portion for Empire Wind 2. So there is uh, more sort of technical challenges to work through. So this sort of ties in permitting with some of the other sort of logistical challenges with planning out a project like this. As you can see, we sort of, with the Empire was started as far back as 2017. 
if we're lucky, we will be in service by 2027. So, uh, and it's a new industry. So components need to be manufactured way with a very long lead time. Um, engineering needs to mature in order to know exactly what it is that you're gonna build. So the complex permitting process, including the interplay between federal and state, you need a lot of technical inputs. So what size are your foundations gonna be? How tall is your substation gonna be? How exactly are you, going to, are you going to lay your transmission lines? All of that has to be sort of locked in on the federal process while engineering is still going on. So there is a, a very strong push pull between the engineers who are trying to figure out and optimize and build the best project that they can. And us in permitting who are saying, well, we can't change the permit because it's you know, going to take us five years to get to the finish line. And if you change, us, change it now, we're going to have to go back to, back to the drawing board. So, then on top of that, you have time of year restrictions for when you can actually do in water work. We have sturgeon and flounder are sort of the main uh, protected species that we're dealing with for the offshore work. For some of these, we may only have a three month window in a year to do the work. And so you have to not only get your permits in time, but also figure out how you're gonna either fit your work into the work window or work very diligently to convince New York State that they should allow you a little bit of leeway. Um, Securing manufacturing capacity while out ahead is very challenging. Grid interconnection timing is also very uh, un, uncertain. Um, grid upgrades are generally paid for by the developer. And so it's not just the fact that you don't necessarily know what it's gonna cost you when you go in. You also don't know how, how long it's gonna take and how, you know, what the extent of the grid upgrades are gonna be since that New York ISO process is running kind of on a parallel track. Um, because we have contracts through NYSERDA, there are certain uh, guaranteed economic benefits to New York in terms of what the project is spending in the state, as well as agreements for a project labor agreement, prevailing wages for construction in the US. And so we have to make sure that we're not only advancing the project, but meeting our commitments uh, to NYSERDA. So I think that covers most of it. I, I, you know, also the Inflation Reduction Act has sort of thrown a little bit of a curveball. It, it helps in certain areas, but our project is fairly well advanced. And as I mentioned, some of the manufacturing capacities in the US are, are not where I think they need to be. So there, there's a whole sort of dance between this plus inflation and sort of various tax provisions that have ch certainly changed since the projects were originally sort of envisioned and, and proposed. Some for the better, uh, some uh, not so much. A Couple of very quick case studies on just challenges um, in terms of getting all of our permits to line up. In order to do anything to build the, the wind farm, we need the staging port to be ready. So once we get our permits from the federal side in 2024, then there needs to be sort of a, a, a race to get construction going to develop the wind farm staging area. As you can see, this is the, the red area. Um, this is subject to the 200 plus New York City permits that I was mentioning. Um, plus there are probably a dozen different contractors involved. So. As we work towards more certainty in the permitting process, there's a lot of, uh, how can I say it, anxiety from the folks who are actually going to be building it, or are we going to have our permits in place? If our permits aren't in place in the time that we need it, the wind staging port won't be done in time, so we can't turn it over to our installers who are going to be taking the turbines and bring them out to the lease area. If we don't get those out in time, then we won't be able to turn on the power when we have committed to New York State. So. There is a, it is a massive dance between various technical permitting and uh, stake, stakeholder issues. Um, and these are really three, three mega projects when you consider Empire One, Empire Two, and SBMT as being very large projects in their own right. Um, it just takes, takes a lot to kind of keep, keep things moving in the right direction. So as it is a new industry, I think we are learning things as we go, maybe future projects uh, some of the regulations on the federal side will have evolved to smooth some of the coordination between agencies. On the New York State side, we had amendments to Article 7 that put a supposed 12-month clock. Uh, I'd say most developers and most agencies don't prefer the uh, litigated or contentious approach in Article 7 that would keep that clock running. So that clock gets paused while everybody goes and sits around the table and works very diligently to come to a, a negotiated settlement. I think that's best for everyone but it is also a risk for projects because no one knows how long one could be in settlement. You pause the 12 month clock. Once you start it up again, you have however many months were sort of left over plus an additional six months could be added on if the you know, various factors play in that the record hasn't been developed well enough. So when you think about all the federal side that is also trying to sync up with the state side, 
um, there are a lot of challenges to keep everything kind of moving in the right direction in the right time frame. So I think that's about it. And uh, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Our next panelist uh, is Kate Daniel. Kate represents the solar industry component of our uh, energy sectors for today's panel discussion. Um, Kate serves as the Northeast Regional Director for the Coalition for Community Solar. She is responsible for leading campaigns to strengthen and sustain community solar markets in both New England and New York. She previously served as the Director of Policy for Catalyze, an innovative energy services partner and independent power producer, where she played a role in accelerating the transition to renewable energy by creating new profit opportunities for commercial and industrial estate, real estate owners. Prior to that position, she was a consultant with Sustainable Energy Advantage, where she conducted policy and market analyses of the renewable energy sector in the Northeast and supported public sector clients in clean energy program design. Ms. Daniel is previously part of the team that runs the database of state incentives for renewable, renewables and efficiency. Desire, I think, Kate. <laughs> That's the acronym out of the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center. Kate, welcome. Thank you, and thank you very much for having me today. Thank you for being here. Um, I am last but least only in height and, and really looking forward to talking with you all about this uh, additional segment of the renewable energy economy here in New York. So first, a little bit about my organization, um, the Coalition for Community Solar Access, or CCSA. Uh, we're essentially a trade association of community solar uh, industry. Um, we're a national coalition of over 100 members of both businesses, nonprofits, and, and other groups working to make sure that every American household and business has access to clean, affordable, local energy. And so we work with stakeholders across the spectrum from utilities to policymakers to customers to make sure that community solar programs really work for all involved, starting first and foremost with the customer. All right, so I think um, hopefully folks are, are fairly familiar with the concept of community solar, but I will take a moment to level set. Um, what we're talking about here are uh, projects at the distribution level scale. So they're one to five megawatts in scale. That's about enough to serve a few hundred households, anywhere from two to a thousand um, and they take up up to you know 25 to 30 acres of land so a, a much smaller scale than our large scale utility scale projects um, but much bigger than you know your rooftop solar and the model here is that these projects uh, provide an opportunity for customers to subscribe to a, a output of that project and those customers are all types. So we serve a lot of residential customers um, and especially because about one third of Americans don't have access to their own rooftop solar because they're not homeowners. Uh, they are homeowners that don't have a properly site, a situated roof or structured roof for solar, or they don't have the economic means to make that investment. Uh, but we also serve uh, nonprofit organizations schools, local governments, large commercial entities that also face the same issues as being tenants in a commercial property uh, or not having the, the access to capital to, to do their own systems. And in exchange for that subscription, these customers receive a bill credit on their, their utility bill. 
So what that looks like typically is that um, we have a, a community solar company who builds, owns, and operates a solar project that's sited somewhere on the distribution grid as what we call front of the meter. So it feeds power directly into uh, the grid. The distribution utility receives that power and uses it to serve other customers. And they also uh, provide the bill credits from the output of that project to the subscribers. So the community solar project owner provides the utility with a list of the subscribers and their relative out, uh, share of that project's output. And the utility takes that list and calculates what each subscriber should earn in bill credits based on that last month of metered production. From the value of those bill credits, uh, the subscribers then pay the project owner, um, and usually that is structured to be at a discount to the value of the bill credits. Uh, what's typical is usually about a 5 to 15% discount. So if a subscriber earns $100 in bill credits from their community solar, uh, they may pay the uh, community solar provider $90 for a net savings of $100 or $10 on their electric costs. One thing that's really great in New York is that we have uh, what we call consolidated billing or net crediting. So those transactions can happen all in one step on the customer's utility bill. Um, in other states, that happens usually in two bills. So a, a subscriber gets their credits on their electric bill, but then has a separate bill from the community solar company, uh, which can create a lot of confusion and, and mismatch and timing on the credits and the payments. Um, when this works well, the consolidated billing is really an important tool for uh, transparency, for uh, lessening confusion for the customer, and it provides uh, the customer access to those credits immediately and direct payment to the community solar company uh, directly as well. So it's better for financing those projects because they get payments remitted directly from the utility rather than having to collect individual payments from subscribers. Um, and that makes it important for serving uh, a lot of the population that community solar is really targeting, including low to moderate income customers uh, that may not have high credit scores or uh, small businesses that, that may not be um, you know, high, high credit worthiness either. Uh, this makes investors a lot more comfortable with uh, providing financing for those projects, and it also uh, makes those customers more comfortable with the model itself. So briefly, um, <laughs> community solar is a new industry, but as I'm up with uh, energy storage and offshore wind, I suppose maybe we are the, the veterans of the group. Um, this is why our, our sector is so interesting and exciting, is that really we're all on the cusp of something new. Um, nationally, community solar is available or authorized by, by law in 22 states plus the District of Columbia. Um, and really, as you can see from this chart, it's taken off quite a bit in the last few years and expected to continue to grow substantially. Um, so we're now at over 5 gigawatts of installed capacity nationwide. And that's even despite uh, some tumult and um, all industries, but particularly the sol solar industry over uh, recent years in the pandemic. And New York proudly is uh, the leader here. So New York is the largest community solar market in the US, um, which uh, they eclipsed all the, the other states last year. And in 2022 alone, uh, the installed capacity in New York was uh, half of the entire nation's installed community solar capacity. Um, so that's really huge. And community solar is a really uh, important part of meeting the state's renewable energy goals. It's deployed quickly. You can see here that you know we have grown in New York tremendously in the last few years and really been able to actually put megawatts of renewable energy capacity in the ground and operating and making an impact today. So um, you can see from, from this chart that rapid growth in the last few years, 
We do expect that that will uh, temper a bit, that we'll have sustained, continue healthy markets here in New York. Um, but as with all of our industries, we face challenges. As this market matures, uh, this incentives decline by design. Uh, they are meant to do that. But also we've picked a lot of the low hanging fruit in terms of low cost project sites that um, have access to very feasible interconnection points on the grid uh, with low and, and low cost land suitable for solar. Um, so we do think that this will moderate out over future years. This is another way to see uh, the tremendous growth and opportunity in community solar in the state. So this is a map from NYSERDA on uh, operating community solar projects across the state. Um, and you can see that they are almost everywhere. So in almost every county in the state, except for maybe two or three counties, in over one and a half gigawatts of installed capacity. Um, and that's important, not just because it's a lot of solar, which of course I love and a lot of people love, but this means real investment in local communities. We're talking jobs, not just in the building and the development of these projects, but in long-term operations and maintenance jobs. We're talking tangible property tax or pilot revenues for local communities in hundreds of towns and, and localities across the state. Uh, we're talking about other economic development activities around these projects. And we're talking bill savings to over 100,000 New York customers. And I don't think that that can be underscored. I won't spend too long in the weeds of the revenue structures of the program, but I do think it's important to emphasize some of the components here that have made New York's community solar uh, segment so successful. Um, and one thing to note as, as terminology in New York, we refer to community solar as community distributed generation or CDG. So when you see that acronym, that's what we mean. Um, but there are really two components of uh, the project economics for, for these projects. Um, I'll actually start with the, the New York Sun incentives, which are capacity-based upfront incentives paid to the project at the beginning of the project uh, lifespan, you know, based on the size of that project. Um, those are uh, run by NYSERDA under the New York Sun program and they decline over time in blocks of capacity. So as I mentioned earlier, that is by design, that signals to the market, uh, the, the growing maturity of, of the market. And it also um, helps to calibrate as technology costs decline to be awarding incentive levels at an appropriate level. The New York Sun program also provides the opportunity to incentivize particular types of projects that we want to see. So um, community solar projects get a community adder for the benefit of serving those customers directly. Um, and we also have adders for projects located on brownfields or landfills or uh, multifamily affordable housing types of projects that we really as a, a policy making uh, tool want to encourage and make sure are economic. The other piece of the program is uh, the value of distributed energy resources or VDER value stack. Um, this has been very groundbreaking. New York has really done this well. I think that um, it is a major point to why this uh, program has been so successful. Um, is a continued work on establishing uh, appropriate mechanisms to really capture the value of local distributed solar. So this value stack is not only reflecting, you know, the kilowatt hour energy value that's produced, but it's also reflecting the added benefits to the distribution system of these projects that are sited closer to load and making up grid upgrades to the distribution system, as well as the environmental value um, that captures the greenhouse gas reduction benefit of using renewable energy and displacing other types of fossil fuel. Um, 
New York has really done a good job of looking at this carefully and, and took a couple years to try to find the balance between making the value stack very um, pointed and sending a careful mark, market signal to uh, putting solar at the right time and place on the grid with also being something that is long term and stable enough to attract project financing. Um, and I think that you know we're close to there yet. We're hoping to continue to, to make improvements to this as the market matures, as we understand better the value of these projects. So that brings me to some key takeaways of what's really worked in New York and where our challenges are now. I think first and foremost, and Senator Kaminsky pointed to this earlier in the morning, New York has very clear but ambitious and achievable state targets. New York has a 10 gigawatt distributed solar by 2030 target. And not only is that clear, it sends an important market signal to invest in renewable energy here in New York, but it's got a consensus and buy-in from all sectors of the state government. So this is uh, ordered by the, the commission. It's supported by actions at the legislature, uh, NYSERDA, the Department of Public Service and other state agencies are all rowing together to make sure that we achieve those goals. And market participants, turn to that, they observe that and they say, okay, we have confidence here that state policymakers are going to help make sure that we can deploy these assets. Another reason that New York has been successful is that this is what we call a walk-up program um, with sufficient capacity targets. So again, that 10 gigawatt goal is really important to send that signal of, yeah, come we have space for you we have need for you as i said the incentives decline over time so there is some moderation in that market signal as as far as uh, what looks like a good investment but compared to other states that limit uh community solar capacity to say you know 100 150 megawatts a year and then allocate that capacity with say a competitive solicitation or a closed window of uh, application. Um, having the ability to apply for New York's sun incentive when your project is ready, when it's met the maturity requirements, rather than having to wait for an application window to open or a uh, procurement to open uh, is very beneficial to projects so that they can align uh, all of those steps in the development process that uh, my panel mem members pointed to and not have to do that mismatch in in timing. Um, as I mentioned, the value stack uh, combined with New York Sun incentives provides knowable and predictable revenues, and that is uh, something that is very important again for getting uh, project financing, um, as well as for customers to understand the value that they get by subscribing to a community solar project. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, is really great about how New York has designed the program is that the new NYSERDA has a lot of control and flexibility in the New York Sun incentives. And this really allows them to use those as a tool to adjust to market conditions. So in recent years, as we've seen a lot of inflation and supply chain interruptions uh, in the solar industry and as everywhere, uh, the New York Sun program has been able to respond to that and, and provide the needed uh, incentives to make projects still work. We still have our work cut out for us, of course, and um, there are lots of challenges ahead. I think um, there is a reason that you have been hearing lots about permitting, siting, and interconnection this morning, and um, that is absolutely um, key challenges for community solar, um, as well as large scale solar as well. I think um, interconnection in particular is, is really important to be able to wrap our heads around. Uh, we have challenges at the transmission level, we have challenges at the distribution level. And this really takes comprehensive and collective thinking about how to manage our electric grid 
in order to be able to accommodate the number of uh, renewable energy projects that are needed, as well as how to accommodate the increase in electrification from heat pumps and electric vehicles in those pieces that we really need to deploy and deploy quickly in order to meet our emissions targets. Um, and then I think the other piece that um, I really want to underscore that the challenge and the importance of our billing and crediting issues. So I spoke about the importance of having a consolidated billing system in New York's community solar program and how crucial that is in particular for serving low income customers. Um, unfortunately, we're having a lot of issues with the utilities in getting that to work properly. So there are literally thousands of community solar customers in New York that are multiple months delayed in receiving their bill credits. And this is a very solvable problem. Um, this is, you know, not a, a matter of having to do 600 permits. This is a matter of having to make sure that we have our, our hands and our heads wrapped around uh, workable and manageable utility billing systems and to make sure that uh, consumers are getting the value that they signed up for. Um, so we are working very collaboratively, very diligently on this issue. Um, we have fantastic partners with the Department of Public Service and NYSERDA and the Commission on really holding the utilities accountable here and making sure that we have good dialogue with them to understand uh, how we can address those issues and address them in a timely manner. And um, that dovetails right into, you know, one of our sector's uh, most important objectives is making sure that we are bringing along low income customers and customers in disadvantaged communities. It's really, um, I think, the beauty of community solar and what's, what it's intended to do. I mean, the whole concept is for those that are not able to invest in their own renewable energy systems and receive that financial benefit. Community solar allows those customers to do that. We need to make sure that we are reaching those customers and not just providing them clean energy, but making sure that they have control over their energy supply and that they're receiving real tangible invisible savings from that energy supply. And so we need to think carefully about how we take advantage of federal incentives and federal funds to do that and how we build trust in communities that have not always been served well by the energy industry. And that um, is all I have for us today. So look forward to some discussion. So, it's 12 o'clock. We have a planned keynote speaker. I know that our keynote speaker has arrived, so welcome. Um, I, what I would like to do, since we're at the end of this panel's discussion, um, we had talked about a variety of things, questions from the audience, questions amongst the group. I see that we're out of time, but I don't want to discount that. So what I'm going to do is a speed round. Phil, it's something you're really looking forward to, I can tell by your expression. <laughs> One of the things that we had hoped to achieve today was to talk about where we're going to go and maybe one or two items since we have the audience of legislators policymakers with us. So in closing for the next few moments before we start our lunch, I ask each of you just to take a moment. To identify one or two items going forward that would really help your industry you identify these already. But just in closing, that would help your industry move forward in advance to hit these targets. We all acknowledge today how ambitious they are. I know you're on the spot, Phil, but I ask you to step up and, and if, if each of you can step up and, and just try to think that way for a moment and we'll wrap up our panel. Thank you. Sure, uh, mic check. <laughs> um, thanks, John, for the question and, and, and thank you both for really valuable. Um, presentations I appreciated it um, yeah that's that's a, a good question and there's there's a, a million ways you can approach it um, I'll I'll just uh, provide um, two 
two avenues though. Um, one I already noted during my initial presentation, but at, at the end of the day, especially for um, bulk retail and, and localized energy storage in New York State, which is currently still subject to um, local um, entitlement processes, it's, it's really important that we have um, community and stakeholder buy-in at the, at the local level. Um, and we're, we're supporting that um, from a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that, that NYSERDA is doing to, to implement um, contracting mechanisms to, to support, uh, to support uh, storage deployment. Um, NISO is, is actively working on a, you know, various wholesale market products and, and ways to ensure that um, energy storage is, is valued in the wholesale energy markets. But at the end of the day, um, even, even with a contracted project and a, a, a clear path forward, if, it, if it's not permitted, um, or allowable with, within the local entitlement process, um, that, that project is not going to put steel on the ground and, and not benefit the electric grid and New York State ratepayers. So it, it goes back to you know supporting local towns, um, in, engaging in, in local conversations, and in ensuring that um, we have a feasible path forward from the permitting perspective. Um, and then you know on, in, in a different but, but related world, I would I would say that you know something that excites me is just. Um, some of the wholesale mechanisms that that are being unrolled by by um, NISO and other ISOs and, and RTOs to 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 deploy storage. Um, I, I spoke to uh, FERC order 2222 and the fact that there will be you know aggregated resources um, participating in wholesale markets, and I think that's that's really exciting. Um, some of our projects that have have come online are are a testament to the, the value that energy storage can provide on the grid. And the fact that, that we're now for the first time talking about um, a two-way street where uh, energy is not just injected onto the grid, but you have responsive loads that are, you know, everything from, from aggregated households, which are potentially lowering their thermostats and providing demand response um, and all types of really interesting wholesale market products. I think as uh, as NISO continues to, to understand the, the value of, of storage in relation to intermittent uh, grid, grid resources, um, that will continue to be a really important discussion that we, that we push forward and, and looking forward to seeing some of the solutions that come out of those discussions. Thank you, Phil. Kate. Great. Um, my number one wish list item is on billing and crediting. So I think there's, you know, two very tangible things that will help us with this. One are the work on negative revenue adjustments and the commission had the great foresight to ask stakeholders to work on these to, to propose a set of performance mechanisms to measure the utilities performance on this issue. Um, and then corresponding uh, revenue adjustments and, and essentially penalties for utilities when they do not meet the agreed upon performance standards there. Um, I think those are very important for making sure that going forward, we are all uh, working towards the same goal on this issue. Um, and I think that we can uh, definitely get to something that is uh, very reasonable and works as an in intended, not to slap major penalties on the utilities, but again, to provide the incentives and uh, co um, the same objectives in making sure that uh, customers are, are receiving their values from uh, community solar subscriptions. And the second related piece to that is making sure that there is a deadline for utilities to catch up on uh, delayed projects that have been um, still owed credits. Uh, there are some in um, Con Ed in particular that are uh, up to a year past due and have not been paid. And those are customers that are, are not getting their bill credits. Um, that's also project owners that are not getting paid. Uh, they've been producing energy for uh, months to a year and uh, not seeing their revenue and, and their payments are due and they're in a really tough spot. Um, so that is something, you know, our industry does not find uh, acceptable. Um, and, you know, we've worked very collaboratively with the utilities. They're doing a lot of work to update their, their billing systems. Um, but we really need uh, them to deliver for their customers. Um, 
The second uh, wish list item for uh, community solar, I would say, is um, continued improvements to the VDR value stack revenues. Um, as I said, I think New York has done a really great job with this um, and has uh, given very careful consideration. Um, a few years back, that was done through very collaborative work through some working groups that took very deep dives on different components of that value stack. Um, it's time to revisit some of those pieces. Um, the environmental value in particular, uh, we think there are some major improvements to, to how that is calculated. Um, but there's also uh, you know, additional components such as uh, avoided transmission costs of these projects that are currently left out. Um, we think that this is very important as um, we approach our 10 gigawatt goal and we're gonna have to think carefully about the role of the incentive side of the equation. Um, and again, find something that is a longer term, more steady signal for the market. Thank you, Kate and Josh. I, I asked you bring us to a close. All right, so I, I'll focus on one simple thing, and it's actually a, a process that already exists. As I mentioned, one of the biggest risks for offshore wind, given sort of the size of the projects and the the overlap of of federal, state, and local jurisdiction, is kind of having some certainty on permitting timelines. On the federal side, um, major infrastructure projects like Empire Wind and Beacon Wind are frequently what are called Fast 41 projects. So there is a federal dashboard that's administered by FIPSI, the Federal Im Permitting Improvement Steering Council, I believe is, is the acronym. Um, it is a public facing dashboard. It includes milestones for all the permits, all the consultations that are sort of linked together. It doesn't mean that permitting timelines can't slip, but it does mean that they are out there in the public and any time that they do slip, there needs to be a consultation between the agencies and there needs to be an agreement and the developer also has, has an opportunity to sort of weigh in and to try to mitigate. Um, from meeting with FIPSI a, a number of months ago, I, I learned that there is an opportunity for states to opt in. So if there's a parallel state process, states can sort of sign an agreement with FIPSI and agree to, agree to have uh, state permitting milestones also put onto that federal dashboard and be handled in a similar, similar way. I think that would do potentially quite a bit to help coordinate and give at least a little bit more certainty as, as these varying processes uh, are, are not really designed to work together. And as these per, these projects go ahead and, and try to, you know, sort of make their way through a variety of different permitting processes, anything that can help give a little bit more more certainty on, in terms of timeline and sort of steps uh, would, would be beneficial. And that's something that are, is already out there. It would just be a matter of sort of a, a, de a decision by New York State to sort of sign an agreement with FIPSI and, and move in that direction. So I think I think that's my one sort of wish list. There are certainly a lot of other challenges, but given the short time and the fact that this is an easily implementable one, I, I figure that's what I'd close with. Thank you, Josh. I wanted to thank, on behalf of the Environmental and Energy Section of the State Bar Association, our excellent panel this morning. I think as folks can see from Phil, Kate, and Josh's presentations, we could probably do this for multiple days and still barely scratch the surface. So I thank you for the hard work you put in and the time. Um, in terms of time, it's now about 10 after 12. We have um, an excellent opportunity with our keynote speaker today. So I ask folks, um, grab your lunch, come sit down. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break from the online presentation for a few moments. We are joined by Rory Christian, the chair and CEO of the New York State Public Service Commission. So it's an honor that you're here. We appreciate your time. We look forward to starting promptly at 1230. So I ask everybody to keep that in mind as uh, we move forward to the next 20 minutes or so. Again, thank you to our panel. We are going to... Um, to move forward on our scheduled uh, order of events today. So I thank everybody for coming back, sitting, enjoying their lunch. Um, today, um, it's an honor for the environmental and energy section to bring to you the keynote speaker. We have talked today about the intersection of various state programs, incentives, ways that the government has helped transform literally in the past decade or so, an energy system 
that would have been unimaginable perhaps 15 or 20 years ago, but yet it's happening as we all sit here. So without further ado, I'm honored to bring as our keynote speaker, Rory Christian. He's the chair and CEO of the New York State Public Service Commission. He was appointed to this position in October 2021 after serving as a commissioner since June of that same year. Mr. Christian began his career in the energy industry with Keyspan Energy as a civil engineer before transitioning to a role engaging government agencies operating in Long Island and in New York City. He then transitioned to Exelon Energy, where he developed new products targeting public sector clientele. Mr. Christian then served as a director of energy finance and sustainability for the New York State Housing Authority. More recently, he was director of New York Clean Energy at the Environmental Defense Fund, where he oversaw a multidisciplinary approach focusing on lowering the environmental impact of electricity production. He currently teaches energy efficiency courses at the Columbia University School of Professional Studies. He volunteers time with workforce development organizations and is a longtime supporter and former chair of WE Act for Environmental Justice's Board of Directors. Mr. Christian graduated from the City College of New York's Grove School of Engineering with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and an MBA from the Baruch College Zicklin School of Business. It's a great honor to welcome our keynote speaker for 2023's annual legislative forum, Mr. Christian. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Oh, I guess, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so again, I want to thank John for the introduction, and uh, I also want to thank Todd Kaminsky for the invitation and uh, letting me know about this event. Uh, it's an honor to be here. This is my first time speaking uh, with the New York State Bar Association, particularly with this committee. Um, as mentioned, my name is Roy Christian. I'm the chair of the Public Service Commission and the CEO of the Department of Public Service. Um, for those of you unaware, the primary mission of the Department of Public Service is to ensure affordable, safe, secure, and reliable utility service for the people of New York State. We also work with, uh, uh, we also work to protect the natural environment and stimulate effective competitive markets for clean renewable energy and distributed energy resources. Now, our regulatory jurisdiction extends over New York's investor-owned utilities. That would include the six major electric utilities, electric and gas utilities, and the five major gas only utilities. Uh, this also extends to water utilities, municipal utilities, um, cable companies, power generators, and energy service companies. <clears throat> In addition, as a result of the uh, LIPA Reform Act, we also provide regulatory oversight of electric utility operations on Long Island. Now, uh, I came in towards the end of the previous panel, but I get the impression that for the better part of the day, um, you've heard from a variety of distinguished speakers on the various efforts currently underway in New York. Uh, all of these efforts with the goal of addressing the climate crisis we currently face. Um, so what I want to do today is take some time to talk to you and provide context about the importance of the actions we're taking, outline the various efforts we have underway at a high level, and uh, also talk about the opportunities and challenges before us as a result of our efforts. So I'm sure this group is keenly aware, but last year, 2022, there were almost $165 billion in damages attributed directly to climate change. This includes loss of life of 470 plus people. Now, this makes 2022 the third worst year for billion dollar disasters. The first and most damaging being 2020, with 2021 taking a close second. So for three consecutive years, we've had broken records for climate action, climate damage. Now, over the past 40 years that the U.S. has been keeping records, total damage from these events is calculated to be roughly $2.5 trillion. And most of that has occurred within the last five to 10 years. 
Now, I don't have data on international impacts, but it's clear to me that the impacts on lives and livelihoods has been significant elsewhere as well. When we look back to 2020, most of us probably remember the beginning of the COVID pandemic, but I remember with great disappointment, the bushfires in Australia and the damages that was causing. Killed dozens of people, billions with a B of animals, raising communities and ecosystems to the point where many will never recover. The American West has similarly faced issues due to long running drought, but the damage there from fires has not been as severe, fortunately. The threat of droughts, however, has increased worldwide. Though uh, cited often as a contributing factor to the Syrian conflict in 2015, um, drought was one of the main views, main causes of the Arab Spring. Additionally, the Horn of Africa has been ongoing and an ongoing uh, drought that has been going on since at least 2011. But as some areas go without water and suffer the ravages of drought, some are getting far too much. You're also probably aware of the significant monsoon rainfall events that have affected India and Pakistan, causing significant loss of rye. You're also probably aware of the rising temperatures that have also contributed to those rainfalls. And ultimately, what we're seeing both domestically and internationally are weather extremes to the extent never before recorded. When we look to California, their recent atmospheric river has caused them to rethink over a century of established water policy to develop new strategies for what is a rapidly changing environment. All these impacts are also a direct result of the temperature change that we are already experiencing. And according to researchers, we've already baked in a 1.1 degree Celsius increase worldwide. According to those same scientists, to be successful in limiting the effects and the worst impacts of climate change, we need to try to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So keep in mind all the things I just mentioned, all the various events, the droughts, the significant temperatures, the rainfalls, the storms, we're just at the very beginning of what is an emerging climate crisis. This is our call to action. Though New York's efforts alone will not address the entirety of climate change, we're poised to set the stage for success, both domestically and internationally, by being leaders in the things that we will need to both adapt to the emerging conditions and weather their significant impacts to come. So in addition to storms becoming more severe and more frequent, there are other factors that we have to keep in mind as to why these events are becoming more damaging. First, there's simply more of us. Um, you think about population growth over the last 30 and 40 years, we've had significant increases in population, new housing developments, things that were play areas of the country where building a new housing development were once considered marginal are now considered prime or luxury real estate. So in addition to there being more of us, we're building in places where just 20, 30 years ago, we never would have considered building. That combined with the fact that the way we build has not kept pace with the severe impacts of climate change, we have to rethink much of what we're doing if we're gonna weather the coming storms. I think about Hurricane Sandy often, and I think about the infrastructure in lower Manhattan that was severely flooded in what was at the time considered a one in 400 year event. And a one in 400 year event basically means any given year, you have a 0.25% chance of that event happening. Well, recent climate models today suggest that the flooding that we experienced in lower Manhattan isn't a 400 year event anymore. It's more likely a 20 to 30 year event. So we're gonna get more flooding. And now the Department of Public Service working with the utilities, we've worked to ensure that the infrastructure can withstand these increasingly severe events. But the same can't be said for other assets in the area that will also be affected in the future. So again, with more assets, more risk, and a larger share of those assets being in areas that are now at increased risk due to climate change, and with more events being more severe and more frequent, inaction means we're willing to accept the risk and gamble with the lives and livelihoods of our people. 
We cannot bet on the hope that tomorrow's extreme weather will go by with minimal impact. And for this reason, we are acting and taking the actions before us today. Now, given what will be an increasingly turbulent future, where more of us are exposed to greater risk from climate change, I wanna discuss now some of the efforts currently underway. I believe some of the previous speakers touched on a number of these. Um, so forgive me if I'm repeating anything you've already heard. But one of the most significant things we'll need to accomplish is a transition from an economy dependent on fossil fuels to one that's powered largely by emissions-free electricity. That outcome is going to be integral to our efforts to significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the near and long-term future. The Commission has and will continue to play a critical role in advancing the various objectives of the CLCPA and supporting the state's full transition to a zero emission electric grid. This is a transition rooted in work that began well over a decade ago by many of my predecessors and has established New York as an innovative leader in identifying and implementing solutions for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Today, statewide, our renewable energy generation sources contribute roughly 30% of our power. Fortunately, when we look at what we have under contract and under construction, we have enough to meet 66% of our electricity needs from renewable energy by 2030. And we have time to procure more and guarantee that we will achieve that 70% target established in the CLCPA. Now, when we first established the clean energy standard many years ago, we established it with multiple pathways, recognizing that we need a variety of approaches to ensure we achieved our goals. As part of the clean energy standard, one of our first efforts was the establishment of a tier one renewable energy compliance obligation, which requires the major electric utilities in New York State to procure renewable energy based on their share of overall electric load. So now, this has supported the development of significant amounts of new renewable energy. And the projects here are expected to provide a significant share of our energy needs by 2030. Our tier two approach looked at existing renewable energy resources. And this was designed to establish financial support to these generators to ensure their continued operation and the provision of that emissions-free resource to New York State. You probably don't hear too much about this program in part because of the success of our other programs. And to, to kind of put out a scope and scale. In 2019, we, the state of New York, procured 650,000 RECs in order to keep these generators in operation because there were no other buyers. Last year, or sorry, in 2021, we only sold or purchased 42,000, a significant reduction. And we expect that number to continue to decline as various, uh, as private sector demand for renewable energy continues to grow. Now, we also have projects designed to produce specific outcomes. Uh, for those of you familiar with Tier 3, that is the Zero Emissions Credit uh, Program, which provides financial support for the continued operation of nuclear power plants in upstate New York. Tier 4, which is a build out of offshore wind, will significantly change the resource mix in downstate New York. Both of these resources will play a significant role in achieving our future emissions reductions targets. Now, as we build out our renewable energy portfolio, we also need to update and reinforce our transmission and distribution system. We need to make sure that our system is robust enough to handle what are increasingly severe weather patterns, severe and unpredictable weather patterns, and that they're resilient enough to come back online in short order. Last year, this commission rolled out what has been the single largest build out of transmission infrastructure in the last 50 years. Our mandate for doing so was established through our elected officials through provisions in the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act. Recognizing the need to act proactively, the legislator directed the commission to take action by identifying the distribution and transmission needs to make our 2030 goals a reality and then to devise a means through which to pay and plan for these funded expenditures. The commission moved forward in doing so, 
we established the coordinated grid planning process, created a working group to which we could uh, get stakeholder feedback, and ultimately move forward with the investments based on the feedback received. And since then, again, we've approved over $4 billion in funding for near-term local transmission needs. These investments will allow us to capture the full benefit of existing renewable energy resources, many of which today cannot provide their full generation capacity due to limitations in transmission in the areas in which they're built. We'll also make sure that uh, through these investments, it's easier for new generators to come online, lowering their interconnection costs, lowering uncertainty, and giving them a better line of sight into where they can develop. Now, we've also taken steps to identify new transmission to support offshore wind, uh, both in Long Island and for New York City. And ultimately, those efforts will play a significant role in helping achieve our various CLCPA goals. Now, given what we're working on, I wanna take a time to talk through the various opportunities and challenges ahead. Now, the actions we're doing today will ultimately significantly change the generation mix in New York State. And it will also make the transmission system far more robust and resilient than at any point in the past. And as I explained earlier, it's necessary to act now if we're gonna be able to withstand the worst impacts of climate change and also have a grid flexible and resilient enough to handle the increasing levels of demand and uh, output from renewable energy generators. But that transmission and generation story is only part of the picture. It represents a small portion of the opportunities soon to come. An essential, yet little discussed, in my opinion, aspect of the transition is the need to create flexibility among all energy users. Our power systems were first envisioned in, a, in the analog era. And much of our relationship with energy today is based on that. Now, this has limited our ability in the past to adopt new and emergent technologies, demand response, rooftop solar, other distributed energy resources. But today, as we move away from this analog, largely one-way grid, we have an opportunity to create a two-way grid, a multi-directional grid, one that can both be based on large centralized sources, smaller distributed utility scale sources, but also integrate small-scale residential and commercial sources, such as rooftop solar, battery storage, and hopefully EVs. These power systems of the future, which will be largely decentralized and flexible, are the perfect opportunity to take advantage of what is rapidly becoming a data-heavy, interconnected, and digital society. The opportunities before us allow customers the opportunity to benefit from flexibility in ways not previously imagined in what was once the analog era. And to illustrate, I wanna talk about a personal experience that's near and dear to me that occurred to me during the pandemic. I had the great misfortune of having my air conditioner and refrigerator break within a two week period of each other in the middle of the summer. Now, when the air conditioner broke, I didn't realize it in part because it wasn't that hot at the time. However, when I got that email from Con Ed telling me that my energy use was 100% higher than the week before, I had to stop and take a moment and understand what was going on. And it became obviously clear I was not getting any air conditioning, but the air conditioning was on. And it had been on for about three days. This is one of the benefits of the grid of the future. I received an alert from my local utility because smart meters were installed. And I'm sure all of you are aware of what smart meters are, but ultimately they allowed me to get information that would have normally taken a month to get to me and would have come in the form of a very significant bill rather than a notice that I was using more. So with this information in hand, I was able to take action, get it repaired, and it only cost me three or four days of significantly higher use than I would have normally done. The second incident was with my refrigerator, and this was a pleasant surprise. Um, I'm sure many of you experienced supply chain issues during the pandemic, but my choices of refrigerators were limited to what I could get on a hot summer day in that August. So I was pleasantly surprised when I read the manual for that refrigerator that I discovered it could participate in demand response programs. Demand response programs, which will one day be possible because they'll be enabled through the smart meters that are recently deployed. So all of these things are coming to a head 
and to create an opportunity to turn us into what some people label as prosumers. Under the analog regime, you simply consumed energy. That was the relationship you had with your utility. Under the digital regime, you can be a prosumer, an individual who not only consumes energy, but also can change your behavior at home to provide services back to the grid for the betterment of the grid, your neighbors, and yourself. And it is in this where I see the greatest opportunity to come. And I see the greatest amount of hope because through these appliances, we open the door to far more possibilities for consumer engagement than at any point in the past. How many among you have a family member whose only relationship with energy is that utility bill and they pay it without any second thought? How many among you have had that conversation with a family member about why is my bill so high? And we're all energy professionals here, so I know you have. And you explain it to them and you talk about how they're using energy and they're perplexed as to why that 100 watt light bulb in the closet is such a big deal. I have this conversation every week, so yeah. Um, but by creating opportunities for people to engage more completely with their utilities, with their power use, we create greater awareness, we create greater interest, and most importantly, a financial incentive to take actions that they would otherwise not even consider. So again, I think smart appliances are gonna play a significant role in our everyday energy consumption in the future. They'll be able to use real-time pricing information from the grid to run appliances at optimal times and give that financial incentive to consumers. And it is through this that I see the greatest opportunity. And I'm hopeful that through our various proceedings, one of which uh, was mentioned earlier, the VITA proceeding, will create a platform through which everyone can be rewarded appropriately. Now, beyond appliances, electric vehicles represent an even greater opportunity. For many of you who drive, I'm sure you're in your vehicle a few hours a day, but for those 20 or 23 hours where you're not, that vehicle sits idle. There are a variety of organizations finding ways to capture the benefit of that vehicle that currently goes unused and provide a benefit to the grid, both through ancillary services or providing direct power to local networks at times of need. So I look at all of these, both our efforts to develop renewable energy, our efforts to build out our transmission and distribution system to make it more robust, and our efforts to enable the customer interaction of the future that will be needed to make it all work. And I see that only through success in these efforts will we continue the trend towards an economy where we can be carbon neutral. We've long shown that we can achieve economic growth without significantly degrading our environment. We are now rapidly approaching a point where we can show that helping the environment can lead to significant economic benefits. So in closing, given that all of us, or most of us here are lawyers, I wanna make a, read out a quote from John Kerry, the special presidential envoy for climate, a quote he made to the American Bar Association a few years ago. He said, and I quote, you are all climate lawyers now, whether you want to be or not. Now, for those of you who've played a role in either the writing, the administration, or the enforcement of laws aimed at addressing the ongoing, ongoing climate crisis, this statement is obvious. But for those of you who have not, be clear that the effects of climate change will affect your work. Your clients will need to be protected. Their interests will need to be understood. And this will have a direct impact on your work for years to come. Navigating this future is gonna require an understanding of the apparent risks and the emerging trends, and you'll need to provide guidance and support appropriate to meeting their needs. So we here in New York, again, we're paving the way. We're doing it here first. No, not California, New York. And the example we set will set the stage for much to follow. So I wanna thank you all for your time, and I'm open to taking any questions you may have. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So we heard a lot today about wind, solar, and battery storage as far as meeting our goals and all the opportunities there, but there's also still a lot of challenges with siting and permitting and getting them online. The question I have for you is, is there anything on the horizon about nuclear energy, small systems being sited anywhere in New York State? So I am very much aware those conversations are being had um, to the degree that we were going to move forward with any particular policy at this time. I can't speak to anything related to nuclear energy. Um, I, I will highlight that we do have an existing program, the Zero Emissions Credits Program, to support existing assets. And I know in conversations with some elected officials, there's been conversation about the potential for deploying small modular reactors. Uh, but at this time, there's no concrete plans for pursuing that. I saw recently there was the, the agreement about the four upstate plants, but that's all there is in New York, correct? Um, I, if you're talking about the zero emissions credit, yes, yes. that's what we're doing right yeah. now. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. thanks. No problem. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, terrific. So um, an issue for all renewable energy projects, especially offshore wind is permitting and especially state permitting. And, you know, it goes across a number of agencies, including the state DEC, which our section has a whole lot of experience with. And um, I know lots of permitting is centralized in the PSC. Uh, is there any effort to or is there a concept that we could latch on to where especially for offshore wind that DEC permits come with come under the PSC or to otherwise expedite the DEC process? Well, I'm not going to speak to uh, the work of the DEC in particular, but we, you know, the established processes in place, uh, we've revised them a multitude of times in anticipation of the workload uh, that is currently before us and to come. Um, in part, the Office of Renewable Energy siting, we've established that for new generation assets, and they're going to play a much more significant role going forward for future projects. Uh, but for the specific question you have regarding the DEC's permitting and the DPS's permitting, our offices do coordinate and work with each other to try to make sure we um, are working as efficiently and as coordinated as possible. And we're always looking for opportunities and uh, ways to improve and make sure that these projects get expedited. So. Uh, if there are particular concerns, happy to hear about them and, and see what we can do to take those into account. Thanks for joining us today. Um, one question I have that um, has surprisingly not come up, and I have reasons I think that might be, is cost. And I think New York has seemed to pursue its renewable energy and clean energy goals in a very cost effective way. But I'm very curious to hear what you as a commissioner um, hear on those and what you think New York has been doing very well and what additional opportunities there are to make sure that we're making these investments at the best uh, value and, and cost to ratepayers. Got it. So there's layers to this. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to capture uh, the fullness of the answer that's appropriate. Um, when I think about cost, I think about it in terms of how do we ensure the lowest cost to our contracting process is one. I also think about it in terms of equitable distribution of costs to those who would benefit. That's two. Um, and then I think also about the financing and, and how all that comes into play and impacting the costs over time. So I'll try to talk about them in order, and hopefully I remember each of the three uh, towards the end. But um, with the first, so we have a longstanding practice, uh, procurement practice. Uh, as you all know, our procurement activities are administered by NYSERDA. Um, the practice that they've been using has been tried and true and proven, um, and is rather effective. And pretty much every renewable energy procurement we do is done using a fairly standardized practice. That said, offshore wind is a bit of an exception given the newness and scope and scale of it. Uh, but we're always looking at how to make sure our procurement from the very beginning will yield the best possible price, recognizing that that's the first step in uh, doing this work. Um, second, in terms of allocation of those costs. Um, so previously, um, when we think about major investments that are done on the grid, 
Usually they've been done in the form of uh, administered through rate cases. Utility will come to the commission, they'll provide their details on their capital projects, we'll provide feedback, they'll do that, it'll be baked into the rate case, and the rate payers of that specific utility would then ultimately bear the burden of that utility's investments. Recognizing that the CLCPA is a statewide policy and that different utilities will be spearheading significant amounts of these investments, what we've done is we've moved forward with a load share ratio approach where we spread the costs for CLCPA re related activities that are borne by a specific utility to all the ratepayers throughout the state. Uh, so we find that given the state level policy direction of the in investments we're making, this to be an appropriate way to equalize the costs uh, throughout. Um, and then finally, from a financing perspective, um, you know, we're looking at everything from the IRA, the IIJA, those will be significant funding opportunities that will ultimately lower the upfront costs and thus the rate impacts for years to come. And, um, you know, we, we, there are a lot of, I, I won't speak to my views on any particular bill, but there are a number of bills that are uh, supporting NIPA to go out and build renewables for the state's benefit. Um, that may have an impact as well. Uh, but ultimately, we look at the cost question a great deal. Uh, that's part and parcel. And if you ever watch any of our commission hearings, you'll know that that's a hot topic of conversation. Um, but we try to do everything in our power to make sure that the rate impact is as low as possible and the upfront cost is similarly as low as it can be. Great. Well, thank you all for your time today. Um, Mr. Christian, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule today. I know you have uh, other meetings to attend to, I think around 1.30, so it's been very gracious and generous. I think that we've had an extraordinary day. Um, we both reflected on the uh, machinations of New York State legislative process and budgeting. We definitely got through that this morning um, with videos and participants, so that was excellent. Our panel came well prepared and demonstrated it. So thank you very much for the time all of you have put in to make this meaningful for everyone. There's a ginormous onion and a million layers, and you really laid it out, so thank you. Finally, uh, the keynote speaker, um, his speech and comments uh, speak for himself, for themselves, and we very much appreciate his time here. So on behalf of the Energy and Environmental Section of the New York State Bar Association, I'm going to bring this event to a close. Um, I thank everybody, both online, around the world, around the country, and folks in this room that took time to participate with us. This will be recorded so it can be reviewed again but as of now the event comes to a close um, with respect to a public service announcement we have a 2:30 executive committee meeting um, here in the building so um, a number of folks you know who you are um, and all who are welcome to attend we'll see you then um, and again thank you very much